Okay, and we're back for part two. Let me close this door. We are back for part two of the recorded class for June 6th. It's now 12.20 a.m. on Monday, June 5th. And so I'm tired and I got to get up early in the morning. Let's get through this. Part B. In part B, we're going to talk about culture as economy, content as culture, and the creative economy. Before we do that, in a way to kind of review what we saw um, an hour ago, 15 minutes ago, when did you see the previous video? This is a typography that is breaking down and sorting out and organizing according to different types and considerations, a typography of art forms. Now we can include culture in here. Uh, these art forms are rather wide, so we could might include culture as well. Um, this is from the Craig 2007 book that we referred to in the previous uh, video and the link is for the full PDF book is available in the Haksap Jario. Appendix A, typo typology, yes I'm tired, typology of art forms by characteristics of that sector. Okay, and so we're looking at forms by its industry with characteristics of low, medium, or high. So let's start with the first one, which was opera. And I'm just going to draw some lines here to help us a little bit. Opera, how much does it depend on government support? A lot. If government doesn't support the opera, the opera fails. There's no way opera can survive from the box office by selling tickets. And it's not going to survive with donations as well, just purely. Even the American form, right, the hands-off, hands-free version, even in the American form, they get some money from government. Um, but Without the tax waivers, the tax discounts that the government allows people who donate, then people wouldn't donate so much. And the opera just couldn't exist without government support. And most of those opera houses, the great theaters where opera takes place, many of those were funded by and maybe are continuing to be funded by government. What's the economic potential for opera? It's pretty low. The uh, number of people who go to opera is not that many. The, you know, opera doesn't play five nights a week or seven nights a week. Opera usually plays two or three times a week, maybe, and only a few weeks out of the year. So they don't bring in a lot of money to the to the community, as we talked last time about people come to town and they stay in a hotel. Well, yeah, to go to the opera, I'll probably go to dinner, and I'll park my car in the parking lot. But there's not a lot of uh, dynamic here. It's not the kind of industry that's going to pull in a lot of money. The economic potential is low. The audience size is relatively low. Even if the opera house can seat 400 or 500, again, remember, it's only two or three times a week, a few weeks in a year, maybe, maybe 18 weeks in a year, maybe. Therefore, uh, it's not going to have a big audience. However, the audience that goes to opera is typically wealthy, highly educated, society's elite. So we would say that their socioeconomic profile is high. Okay, The audience size is small, low, but the People who go are generally wealthy, the so social elite. And what is the diversity of subsectors? Well, there's low. If you are in uh, opera, you're in 
opera. But I'm going to admit that I don't really understand the idea of diversity of subsectors very well. It's not the focus of my attention here. Okay, so we can go through this list and look at classic ballet, visual arts, symphony orchestras, classical music, drama, broadline drama, drama that attracts many people, drama that is a niche that only fewer people would be interested in. Let's go down and look at libraries. I'm going to roll it up a little bit. That much. And with libraries, they depend highly on government support. Libraries are not likely to bring in wealthy people. They're not likely to generate money in the society. Uh, no hotel sales, no restaurant sales. But if we look at the audience size, it's mixed. Some libraries have lots of people, some libraries have fewer people. And the economic profile is mixed. Wealthy people go to the library, maybe not the extremely wealthy, but people who have money go to the library and people who don't have money go to libraries. Diversity of subsectors, again, I don't really understand it. It says low. Now, let's look at a different type of activity. The circus or the physical theater. Okay, physical theater means things where you go and there's lots of activity and uh, kind, kind of like a circus. Uh, could be a comedy, things that are not so stiff and serious and it's not, um, not like a movie, right? So pretty much any kind of stage show might fit if it is more casual and more fun, right? So roll up real quick just to take a look and see our headers again. Ah, turn that off. See our headers again. Dependence on government, economic potential, audience size. Back to the library. High dependence on government. Whoops, wrong one. Uh, circus physical theater. Dependence on government. Low. They don't get a lot of money from government. Which one is that again? I can't remember. Getting tired. Economic potential. Yeah. People go to the theater. People go to the uh, circus. They may travel from out of town. When they go, they spend money. What kind of people go? High and mixed. Audience size is high. Mixed types of people attend. Okay. Um, you can spend more time on that. I just wanted to point it out. If you were going to think about cultural policies, you'd want to think about culture beyond just, oh, it's fun, it's good, people like it. You want to think about uh, what is its potential economic impact in society? How much... Does it depend on government money? Who goes? How many people go? Not only in one show, but over the course of a year, how many people go? And what is their economic, socioeconomic profile? All right. Let's kill that. So, culture as economy, culture, a content as a culture. What is content and the creative economy? All right, so we have four models of what we might call a cultural economy or a creative economy. The first one is the welfare model or the government subsidy model. It says that arts culture is unique. It doesn't have any economic value. Remember we talked about public good before? So it's not something that is consumed, but it's also something that doesn't really have a sellable value. They argue that when you go into the museum and you see great paintings, we can't put a price on it. Of course, we can charge you a ticket. Uh, but if you think at how much the museum paid for all those paintings, 
they're never going to get that back. So the argument is that we we support government supports public supports culture because it is something that is outside of economy and it can never pay for itself and we can't even figure out what it's worth but it's important the second model is a competitive model that says the cultural industries are not that much different than other industries and we should treat it like that you know why is the opera stand up in the you know and sing in the opera why is that different from a movie movies don't get much government support if any it's basically a private business they make a movie they take a chance they take it out to the movie theaters people buy tickets the movie theater makes money they pay money to the film company and at the end of the day the film makes money it's com competition so why is opera different from a movie? It's an argument. It's a model for cultural economy. The third model is the growth model that says that creative industries are something that we can build our economy on, that we can improve our economy, that we'll make work for people. And if we look at the Korean situation right now, there's very much a belief that uh, K-pop and uh, the Korean wave in many forms is something that is driving the Korean economy, both directly because we can sell uh, music, we can sell TV shows to Central America, but also because the guy in Vietnam buys an LG air conditioner, not a Panasonic air conditioner, because he loves Korean dramas, he loves Korean K-pop, he doesn't care for Japanese. So he's got a higher opinion of Korean products because of the culture of Korea. So these creative industries are driving the economy. The fourth model, the innovation model, suggests that it's not just about economy, that culture pushes innovation, that the great designers of microchips, part of their mental development was that they got lots of good culture, something like that. That culture helps push creativity. And we need creativity for a creative culture. So it's an innovative model, innovation model. Okay, these four arguments came from an article in a book. And again, I'm stealing this from a, another document, I'm stealing it from Flew's class notes. I don't have the book, The Culture of the Economy. So it would be cheating, except I'm telling you that's where I got it. So if you decide you want to talk about this kind of thing in a paper, then you can go down to the library and ask them if they can get this book. And the full listing, again, is in the uh, CTL, the Haksab Jario. When we think about the cultural economy we want to think about consumption versus provision, providing. Now, you'll remember that I mentioned previously that public goods are different because they are not consumed. We don't use it up. The culture exists. And maybe the more we do culture, the better we know culture. So uh, this idea of consumption is related in that people use it. People want it and they take it and they pay for it. But the other model is that we make it so that people can take it. So which is more important? It's, we think of it as the driver, the driver. If people want it, the economy will say, we need to make it. We can make money. The other side is, we should make it so that people can get it. Okay, Are we pushing production or are we pushing consumption, encouraging people to use it, encouraging sales, encouraging people to want it? 
It's a little confusing. Let's take a look at an explanation. Whoops. First of all, it says uh, the, the the writer here, this is coming out of Australia, says it's clear that artistic and cultural forms that rely most heavily on government support, the artistic and cultural things that need government money the most are those that are the least popular, those that sell the fewest tickets, those that the fewest people in society say they want. This is a provision model. We need to support this activity because it's good. It's not we need to support this activity because people want it. Okay. We have to build more baseball fields and soccer fields in our town and uh, field golf, you know, the small golf in our town because people want it and there's such long lines and nobody can get in to play. That would be a consumption model. The lines are too long. All the, com all the citizens are calling to City Hall and complaining, I can't play. The lines are too long. There's no spots. It's already dark. I've been standing here since 2 p.m. and now it's 5 p.m. and there's still a line. People want it versus the high arts, right? the highbrow culture, where we are supporting the opera because opera is good and, and we don't sell enough tickets. So the question is, are governments focusing on provision? And I would say, yes, they are. And here is some information from Craig talking about Australia in terms of what Australian people like what they want, what they do. Common, everyday Australians. Take a look at the population. The first preference for culture is cinema. Go to the movies. Then botanic gardens and libraries. That's an interesting mix, right? Botanic gardens, flower gardens, and libraries. And then followed by animal and marine parks, like a zoo, marine park, aquariums. Way below that comes the museums, popular music concerts where the city helps pay for the concert, and opera or musicals. At the bottom end of consumption, what people want the least and do the least come the other performing arts besides opera and musical, theater, dance, and classical music concerts. So it looks like the highbrow, most big A materials are the least popular, but they are what the government supports the most. Look at cinema. Government doesn't support cinema at all. Not generally. Occasionally there might be a special event. What are the cultural industries? Here we're going to define cultural industries as something not quite the original artistic production. Somehow we have to make that artistic production fit, work. We have to adjust it. We have to adapt it, or we have to adapt what we're doing to that artistic creation. Coping means adjusting. Partial reproduction means maybe we don't copy the whole thing perfectly, but we do only part of it, or we do it incompletely. We do it imperfectly. Maybe we can't do 3D, we only do 2D, right? Two, it's a print. We can't actually touch the all three sides. So we're adjusting, working with the artistic creation, on the particular medium that I'm working with. The key is the medium. The media, plural, medium is singular. So the medium include things like movies, recorded music. So we have this symphony that's playing so beautifully and you can go to the symphony and listen live or you can buy a CD. If you buy the CD, it's not quite the same 
as sitting in Symphony Hall. It's not a perfect reproduction, right? Some of the hearing will be missing, but also some of the mood, some of the feeling, the, the glory of being in this lovely place. Okay, so it's an imperfect reproduction of a live artistic creation. Movies, recorded music, or other visual productions. Um, in the museum, we have reproductions. We don't have the originals. If you go to Gyeongju Museum and see some of the old things, it's not the real one. The real one maybe is in Seoul at the National Museum, the Seoul National Museum. But in Gyeongju, where they dug it up, they'll have a reproduction, right? Cultural industries include publishing, printing, radio and TV, and mass performances, where we do something that is ideally in a small theater for 100 people or 200 people, but we do it out in a giant stage, okay, in a giant stage where nobody has a wonderful seat. Uh, have you been to any of the, K the KBS concerts they usually do spring, summer, and fall where various artists come into your town and they put on a show. Well, there's 5,000 people there. It's just not the same as sitting in symphonic hall or whatever. Mass performances, semi-reproducible spheres, means we're kind of reproducing it, but not exactly, of paintings and art, pro art objects. Imagine that you took uh, the Mona Lisa and you take a photograph and you put it on the web. It's certainly not the same as going into Paris, into the museum, and seeing it live, right? It's not really a perfect reproduction. It's actually a long ways away. A beautiful photograph in a big, glossy magazine will look much nicer than what you can see on your computer screen. So it's kind of a semi-reproduction. All right, cultural industries. Here is one way to think about the uh, cultural industries. We have this, what's called a concentric circles model. Basically, it means what is at core and what's a little further, a little further, a little further. We could draw it like a bullseye target for shooting, but we've done it this way. So core cultural expressions come in the middle. And these are, if I can find my... Well, I can't find it. These would these core cultural expressions would be the true original artistic thoughts, expressions. Music as it is intended to be played. Visuals such as paintings or sculptures. Things like that. The original artistry, the way the artist wanted to do it. Then just outside of that, closely related are other core creative industries, audiovisuals, printing. For example, uh, a, an artist will paint something and then probably make 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 very excellent copies uh, through a printing system, lithographs. And then the artist will sign those. And now those signed copies have a value. It's not as good as the original painting, but they're not cheap copies. They are very, very, very excellent reproductions. Okay? So somehow we are taking the originals and we're making them almost as good. The next level out, the wider cultural industries, includes things like publishing, advertising, etc., where there's some argument that it's culture, but uh, maybe not. A lot of people don't feel that it's culture. And then finally are the related industries, design, craft work, etc. For example, uh, do you want to buy fashion clothes? Would you buy an Andre Kim dress? I, I know he's passed away now, but that idea. Do you, uh, any of the ladies or men, your wives, carry a coach bag? Well, that was a design, it's kind of fashion. It's, well, my wife has a few. How oh, ouch, my money. Um, fortunately, there's a coach outlet near my mother's home in San Diego. 
and they're much cheaper there than they are in Korea. So that uh, uh, let's say a chill ship manan bag in Korea, I can probably buy for about ship or shippo manan. Yeah. So when my wife wanted it, I complained, but I didn't complain too much because it could have been worse. Okay, so this is one way of thinking about it. The the very original and things that are really close and a little bit further away and a little bit further away. Um, this also comes from that uh, Flynn, uh, the, uh, the lecture notes. The, the name Throsby, which I'm not actually sure that's right, but the, the concentric circles model is certainly available in many places. Okay, here's something that will explode your brain a little bit, except I see that something is missing in my... Something is weird. Okay. UNESCO, United Nations uh, Science and Culture, or whatever the heck it is, uh, they put together a framework for cultural statistics. Collecting data statistics from all different countries. We have to be able to sort them. So they created these cultural domains, these areas to think about that we can collect data with. And then they also have related. So they have six cultural domains in their field. The first is cultural and natural heritage. Heritage, old stuff. Okay. That could include old dance, classic dance. That could include old buildings. The second one is performance and celebration. Shows, events. The third one is visual arts and crafts. That could include your painting and your pottery. The fourth one is books and press. Press will include even newspapers. Now, our newspapers culture? I never thought of it much that way. E, audiovisual and interactive media. I don't know why the A is missing, but I stole this picture. Audiovisual and interactive media. So that could include TV, movies, interactive media, games on your computer. F, design and creative services. Creative services, what is that? Well, that could include things like advertising. Because advertising is usually interesting. Do you remember the wonderful TV advertisement for Kia Soul? The car, Kia Soul? The hamsters, they were so cute. Americans loved that commercial. In fact, they only made one as an experiment, and people loved it so much that I think Kia made five or six more hamster commercials for the Kia Soul. That was creative. That was advertising. Okay, and these six items are tied together under this bigger theme of intangible, not physical, you can't really touch it, cultural heritage, which includes oral traditions and expressions, rituals, languages, social practices. That means these ideas could fit anywhere. A book could be about intangible cultural heritage. Okay, A show is intangible, you can't touch it. Now, cultural and natural heritage very possibly could be tangible. You could touch it. But it tells stories. Why is the building famous? The building is a building, and it's old. But why is the building famous? What's important? That's intangible. The story is intangible. Uh, the related areas are tourism and sports and recreation. So if you go to the Samsung Lions game, when they open the stadium up, is that culture? Well, UNESCO says it's related. Again, we're looking at intangible cultural heritage as something that can go in there. It can fit. 
Finally, underneath there are three major areas, education and training, archiving and preserving, equipment and supporting materials. These are things that are related to these. They don't match up. So we have education about tourism. We have education about visual arts, right? We have classes where you can learn traditional pottery. This is all culture and arts. This image is from a Kindle book. Kindle, you know, Amazon, play it on your phone. I have lots of Kindle stuff on my big, huge phone. It's easy to read. So the content industries, again, we're going back and forth, content and culture, because they seem to, the, the world seems to be moving from culture to content. The content industries are the content economy. Many people, when they're talking about the content industries, they're talking about online content. This seems to be the fascination of the 21st century since 2000. Everything is online, online media. It doesn't have to be. So I made my note down here at the bottom. I'm not so sure only online. Okay? The content industries are related to online and offline. It includes mass information industries like the New York Times, like Facebook. And content industries include cultural industries. Uh, somebody draws cartoons, manhwa in Korean, right? Manga in Japanese. They draw cartoons. It becomes content because we use that cartoon to develop the industry, right? So content industries, mass information industries, and cultural industries. There's a kind of a crossing and emerging into these content industries. Does it have to be online? I'm not so sure. Okay, so creative industries, right? We went from culture to content to creative. Creative industries are related to the management of, create, of creative work, okay? It's not just being creative, it's not just making something creative, but it also includes the people who manage it, the people who, example, arrange for it to sell, they package it, they do advertising for it. All of the things related to creative work are included in creative industries. And in fact, some people will say that the artist, yeah, they create the content, but without these managers, it would never go anywhere. This artist would be sitting on the side of a mountain with 200 paintings he has done, and they're just sitting because he doesn't have any way to let people know that they're for sale. So he's starving. He's hungry. He has no money. He has to go work on the farm because he can't make money doing what he's really, truly gifted with. So management becomes very, very important. And if you want to call it administration, okay, fine. Creative industries are working with Things, products that have a lot of symbolic value, okay? It's not just pretty or interesting, but it has to be somehow important. Now, if you like some of the more modern forms of art that I look at and I say, I don't know what it is, and I don't know what the artist is trying to say. It doesn't, it doesn't speak to me. It doesn't have any symbolic value to me. But there's a lot of other people who love it. So we're looking for the creative industries. We're looking at things that somehow are going to have value based on its intellectual properties, the things that come from the human mind, or you could say the human heart, the human spirit. Korean says mind here. In English, we say mind here, okay? The creative mind. So we need things that are based on creativity, but they have value outside of that. So for example, fashion or fashion design, architecture, 
gastronomy. I love this one. And advertising. Advertising. Doing something creative like the hamsters in the Kia Soul. Gastronomy. Have you got that one? Gastronomy means food and drink that we love. Wonderful food. Gastronomy is the science of food. So, for example, you might want to have a sommelier. You know, the airlines nowadays, they all have their sommelier that chooses the right wine to go with uh, that's bitter on an airplane, right? Some wine is wonderful on the ground, but up at 30,000 feet, at, at uh, 10,000 meters in the sky, it tastes different. Our tongues work differently. So we have sommeliers that know what wine goes with what food, what wine works well at altitude. Um, gastronomy is related to food and drink. So it's a great chef and he creates wonderful dishes. He would, you know, he is working in the field of gastronomy. Look at my belly. Am I gastron? Am I a gastronome? Not so much. I'll eat pretty much anything. I'm not so artistic in my eating. The point of creative industries is that we're making money from ideas. Okay? Those ideas don't have to be especially cultural. We're making money from ideas. Creativity is the development of new ideas. So it can it can and it does include culture and arts, but it can include lots of other things. The problem is this idea, creative industries, is so general, so vague, so wide, that you can include anything into the creative economy. Right? Anything you can imagine that is an idea, you know, uh, do you remember Pet Rocks from the 1970s? Or Chia Pets, the clay little animal with the chia seeds, and you watered it and it grew out and made kind of grass growing on it. It's creative. I'm not really sure it's cultural. Creative industries consider culture so broadly. And in, in here is one phrase, human agency, the ability for humans to do what they want to do. Okay, Human agency is human uniqueness, human freedom to do what they want. The humans are not like uh, a cow that is kept in a fence. And this cow is being raised for meat. And that cow is being raised for milk. And now that it's making milk, we milk it every day for two years or three years, and then it becomes low-quality meat, right? There's no agency. They don't have freedom to make their own choices and do their own style. So culture becoming the idea that it's human agency to produce meanings from everyday life. I see something in the ordinary life, and I create a new meaning. This is a little chocolate. Now, I love chocolate, and it is a chocolate mint. If you can see inside it, I don't know if you can, but there's a green layer, kind of green, kind of white. It's a mint. I love chocolate mints. And in America, in our big holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever, when we have big meals, big fancy meals, at the end of the meal, after the wine, you know, as a kind of a light snack, there's often mints. They often are thought of to, A, make you feel fresh, B, maybe clean your breath a little bit. Somebody thought of mixing chocolate and mint. And then another person, and I did this took this pretty wrapping and put a little hook on it. And last year I did this with paper clips, but I don't think I have any paper clips right here. 
you know, clip, paper clip. And I put it on my Christmas tree because I love mints and it's pretty. So I put it on my Christmas tree like a decoration. And that was my creativity. And I produced a meaning, a Christmas ornament, like ball, shiny balls or cards. And I, I hung chocolate mints on my Christmas tree. So human agency to produce meanings from everyday life. It's so broad, it could be anything. All right, here's another way to look at creative industries. This has been very influential. This has affected many people's thinking about what is culture, what is creative industry. In 1998, the Department for Culture, Media, and Sport in the United Kingdom created a document. It was called the Creative Industries Mapping Document. Now, this actually came before the UNESCO uh, statistical scheme that we saw earlier. This is 2009. This is 1998. And at this time, UK was part of the EU, but the UK was ahead in terms of this idea. And so in this mapping document, they tried to assign all different kinds of creative industries and give it a code, a kind of a typography, and say how this fits with this and how this fits with that. And they made a list of creative industries. This is not a complete list, but it this is a list from a book down below by Ruth Taus. And the list that she provides is advertising, creative, sure. Architecture, yeah, making pretty buildings, okay. Art and antiques markets, selling art, selling antiques. Is that creative industry? Now I'm a little less sure. Computer and video games, creative, yeah, okay. Korea thinks it's really important. Crafts, making pottery, whatever, okay. Design, designing things uh, that can include technological design, like making new microchips. Is it creative? Sure it is. Is it culture? Some design is culture, some, but you know, designing the next microchips for Samsung, for the next best computer, is that creative? Yeah, but it's not really culture, not related at all. Designer fashion. Okay, the Andre Kim look. Yeah, well, that's culture. It's kind of commercial culture. Remember we talked in our earlier weeks about commercial culture versus the highbrow culture. Film and video, okay. Film will include mo movies here. Film, movies, and video. Music, all kinds of music. Performing arts. This could be theater, opera. It could include music. could be a dance, ballet. Publishing. Well, the writer wrote the story or the book or the manhwa. That was the art, the culture. Is publishing it, the guy that made the book, is that really a creative industry? Hmm. Software. Yeah. Television and radio. Well, yeah, could be. But interestingly, this is from Ruth Tao. She says this list does not include museums and does not include built heritage. In other words, that building, that great castle. Because it's culture, but it's not creative. The museum's done. Right? It's all old stuff. That's the argument. Do you agree with it? I don't know. And this comes from Ruth Tao's book. Again, the link is in the, uh, the, the, the citation is in the web page, the CTL page. Uh, this is a, a real book. I had the book in my hand. It is not um, online. So what 
do these creative industries look like in the economy? What does the creative economy look like? Well, this is an old picture, but I haven't found a newer one. In the year 2012, in the United Kingdom, we can see using that kind of a map, typography, how many jobs there were in each sector. Now, in this particular uh, map, they did include museums, galleries, art gallery, art show places, and libraries. And they said there's 85,000 people working in this field. In pure craft, for example, pottery, there's 7,000 people. A real traditional art, maybe it's a middle level art, it's not highbrow, middle level art, there's only 7,000 people. Advertising and marketing, 143,000 people. IT, internet, uh, in information technology, software and computer services, half a million people. This is for UK. Music, performing, and visual arts. That can include pop music, country music, classic music, 224,000 people. This is not just the musicians. It's everybody who's related to it. If you work in a uh, orchestra as the guy who takes care of the instruments, right? the musicians don't take care of the biggest instruments, the timpani or whatever. Those are symphony instruments. They have staff who take care of that. The staff who sells tickets will be included in this number. So the total employment in the creative industries in the UK in 2012 was 1,684,000 people. What percentage is that of the total employment in UK at that time? I don't know because the numbers don't match. I can find out the total number of people working in the UK in that year, but we count things differently. So I'm afraid to say. But it does show that IT, publishing, film, three things that we wouldn't maybe call culture in the classic sense, are the biggest numbers. It's a million people. Out of 1.6, it's a million people. These three, publishing, IT, software, and computer services, film, TV, video, blah, blah, blah. Now, this one is the one that's closest to what we would call culture. If we just count these two, totally outside of anything related to culture, we would think it's 790,000. It's almost half. So it looks like government has a reason to want to include these creative industries. And the people who are trying to promote creative industries have a reason to count these things because it makes it look much more important than if we just count the pure classic artist. Well, we're almost done. Here's my last slide for tonight. Taiwan is instituting a new citizens participatory process for cultural policy. Citizens participation in public policy making, in public deliberations. Uh, Daegu has done a little bit on this. Korea has done a little bit on this. You're welcome to read this article. Again, the link is in the uh, CTL. It's not a great article. It's not, uh, not perfectly well written. It's not exactly what we want to talk about. But it is raising the question, should it be only government that decides what is culture? Should it be the elites, right? Those people who are sophisticated, who are making decisions about culture policy, or should we let 
the average everyday citizens participate in this question, in this decision. So Taiwan is offering the possibility that maybe we should let citizens participate. And is it a perfect situation? No. Is it a perfect system? No. But it's another idea. And that will finish this recorded lecture for week six in our graduate school class on culture policy. We will be back in the classroom next weekend, June 13th. And then we will have a Zoom class, live Zoom chat kind of class with video on June 15. And you'll get more information about those uh, in the Saturday 13th class and probably online before that. So thank you very much. Good night. And I'll see you June 13th. As always, if you have any questions or problems, don't be shy to send me a, a cacao. We're all in the cacao group. Ask me, ask your classmates. Uh, let's help each other. Take care, be safe during this uh, COVID-19 time. Good night.